Hello everyone, welcome back. I am August Sandberg for 59 North, hosting this podcast alongside Andy Shell. This is the last episode of this season of the Quarterdeck Sailing Podcast, but do not panic. That means that next Tuesday, On the Wind is back on. So we'll see you guys over there. We've done some very cool interviews that we are looking forward to sharing with you all. The Quarterdeck is our membership website and 59 North's home port on the internet. We post videos and articles and host live streams and all sorts of fun on there. And we have a very knowledgeable community that you can be a part of. It is also the easiest way to interact with me and Andy directly. Go to 59-north.com slash quarterdeck and sign up today for a two week free trial. Becoming a quarterdeck member is also a great way to support what we do so that we can continue to make free sailing content such as this very podcast. So a huge thanks to everyone who signs up. All right, please enjoy this week's episode and hold fast. I was writing an article for Yachting World about my Greenland trip, and there's a little sidebar section in there about weather. And and my, I've I've actually my thoughts on weather haven't changed much over like a long time. Like if I think about articles I've written in the past, I actually wrote one for a small Caribbean magazine like ten or twelve years ago uh, about like the interaction uh, about chaos theory because I was reading a book about chaos theory at the time, and and actually I had just I just finished reading Jurassic Park again for the umpteenth time mm. and um chaos theory is is the whole the, the malcolm character the jeff goldblum character chaos theory is his whole thing that's the theme he talks about throughout the book and uh, i just pulled up a quote here they they actually describe chaos theory as it relates to weather in the book and that's kind of what inspired me to talk about weather today so um when you're ready i'll start with this quote I mean, I think I think we're off to a great start already. You, should we just uh, should we just roll? That's a great intro. Yeah, Love yeah, that. yeah. I just assumed we, I assumed we were rolling. I always assume that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's just go for it. So, all right. So, this is so cool. First of all, this this like my favorite thing is taking. I mean, it's like sailing. Like what we do is like pretty low stakes. You know, no one really gives a crap. Um, but my favorite thing is to take like areas of other other things, whether it's science or whatever and just apply that to to what we do especially to seamanship um and this mm. chaos theory is, is is a super interesting part of that and actually chaos theory started with weather prediction so this is straight from the book this is not malcolm's quote but this is like michael Crichton, the author like this is his description of chaos theory so it says here chaos theory originally grew out of attempts to make computer models of weather in the 1960s weather is a big complicated system namely the earth's atmosphere as it interacts with the land and the sun the behavior of this big, complicated system always defied understanding. So naturally, we couldn't predict weather. But what the early researchers learned from computer models was that even if you could understand it, you still couldn't predict it. Weather prediction is absolutely impossible. The reason is that the behavior of the system is sensitively dependent on initial conditions. So as I'm reading Jurassic Park, just for fun, I'm like in my head, like getting all excited about, oh man, I can't wait to talk about this. Cause this is like exactly how I frame my lectures. And I think it also is just a reminder as an aside of like how much individually our past influences has on the way we think about things. Like I read Jurassic Park was the first book I read, like the first adult book I read as a kid. I, I remember reading it on our Bahamas trip when I was 10 years old mm. and like, that stuff just sinks, seeps into your brain, and your you know your your experiences now are are a product of all the things you've learned before. So so somewhere along the line, I've been thinking about this my entire life, which is which I think is cool. That is <clears throat> that is really cool. Yeah, and um, and uh, I, I guess it's the uh, the butterfly effect, isn't that what it is? Which which is actually that that is also talking about weather, right? If you like the full. The full butterfly thing is that a, a a butterfly flapping its wings on one side of the earth can cause a hurricane on the other side, which is weather and chaos theory all in all in one. Exactly. So it says right here, the shorthand is the butterfly effect. A butterfly flaps right. its wings in Beijing, and the weather in New York is different. The reason I'm leading off with this is, I I have been making more clear. As I teach the weather briefings on our passages, we just got back. I just got back from Portugal. Um, 
every time I go through it, it's like a little bit more clear how I think about weather. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today is how to think about this. Not how to use the forecasting tools or anything, but how to think about it. And I'm not sure how long this is going to go because I actually think it's pretty simple. So <clears throat> to, to kind of emphasize that chaos theory idea, the whole butterfly effect thing is at some point in the past, science thought that if we just knew the initial conditions for everything exactly, if we could know exactly everything at any given point in time, we could predict everything. And incidentally, those that are into sci-fi, there's an awesome TV show that, um, that is based on that idea called Devs. Um, the director is um, uh, Al- Alex Garland, who wrote the book The Beach and then started directing movies. And his, his one movie is called uh, Ex Machina. It's one of my favorite sci-fi movies of all time. It's about... Oh, like, I love that one. Yeah, yeah. About AI, yeah. But anyway, this mm. TV show, it's one season, eight episodes, really good in and out. Um, but it basically is the premise where, where uh, the main character develops, develops an AI that is able to predict the future of everything because they know the initial conditions. It's this whole idea that science had a long time ago. Mm-hmm. But then chaos theory was born out of the idea that actually... It's complex systems are so complex that it's impossible. Even if you knew the initial conditions, you you could never get it down to the closest decimal point because even a decimal point in the millionths would, would affect the outcome beyond a couple days. So what's interesting about weather is models, you know, we talk about grid models and stuff. So bringing this back to weather, talk about grid models. Models have gotten really, really good at predicting three to four days into the future. Hmm. And beyond that is when you see, start to see this butterfly effect really show itself, where it's like really difficult to predict beyond three to four days. And then another aside here quickly, this is how these podcasts go. Um, <laughs> it also makes you realize when you understand the underlying science, it makes you realize that like our efforts at predicting climate change are just completely completely worthless like not that we shouldn't worry about climate change on the contrary we actually have no freaking idea how the the changes and if it you know the butterfly effect states the tiniest change in the initial conditions causes dramatic changes in the outcome in the prediction and like what Mm. we're doing to the climate is not tiny changes it's massive changes so to think that like climate science, I hate when climate scientists put out these papers that say, well, in 2050, the oceans are going to be this. You have no fucking idea. Like none. No idea. Absolutely none. And it like, I, it just, it, it yeah. makes actually, it makes the efforts, I think, of actually doing something about it in the present even, even worse because they're always wrong. They're, they're always wrong. Yeah, and, and then it's, it's just wrong. like, oh, science is wrong. You're you're a bunch of idiots. And then the, the you know the naysayers <laughs> use that as as ammo. And anyway, I'm getting yeah. off tra- topic yeah. now. But it it, it is a, it is a, a really really good point in how in how all of this is uh, and and weather too, especially is is communicated with this like I I guess to you know to to scare people and to, to just to have something to put into a. A headline you'll you'll kind of make up these scenarios and they'll say okay yeah 2050 such and such is going to happen um i guess to arouse people a, a little bit but personally i think it's much scarier that you just don't have a, a fucking clue what's gonna happen and i mean that that's much more scary to me and uh, and the same is true with uh, weather forecasts you know when when yeah. you look when you look out to the um in the yeah, in the in in the future, when you when your grips guessed past the fourth, the fifth, the sixth day, uh, you might see some some weird and scary things on your um uh, on your your screens. But uh, you know, it's all it's all lies, and it's all it's, it's all it's none of it's true, and 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 that's much more scary than what the mm. actual numbers might be. So so bringing this back to practice, and again, how I think about this, so. I always frame a weather forecast and, and the, the, cause the whole reason we want to know the forecast is so we can create our strategy. Okay. So you've got, well, actually, so we can create our tactics really strategy is like big picture. That's like planning the seasons, all the rest tactics is like, okay, what are you going to do in the moment? So the reason we want to know is so that we can, we can tactically navigate this. So I look at this in terms of two things, certainty and the trend. So, Really, we know that the farther from this origin in time the forecast is, the less certain we are about the outcome. 
So right off the bat, okay, the certainty decreases over time. But there's other ways to look at that. So like you can see, uh, it, it, you know, two to three days is pretty accurate. Most models are, are good at two to three days to give you a sense of what's going to happen so you can prepare. And remember, my whole thing with seamanship, it's like two, it boils down to two things. It's being able to anticipate and then being able to adapt. So we're at the end. We're trying to anticipate what's going to happen over the sort of short term. Um, and this is different from like when you plan the seasonal calendar, that's kind of planning around the climate, the, the overall big picture weather patterns, not sailing in hurricane season, all the rest. We're talking now, okay, you've committed to a route. You're either looking for a departure window or you're already at sea and you're, you're, you're figuring out your tactics for that. So over the next two to three days, if you look at either one model taken at different times, or two models, and you look at how they differ from one another. So if we look at the same model taken at different intervals, so either like 12 hours or 24 hours apart, if that same model is more or less giving you the same output each time there's a new model run, that's a greater degree. I have a greater level of certainty that the weather is going to do what it's going to do or what it's predicted to do. If I have two models or three models or whatever, um, and if they all line up, over say that three day window, then I have a pretty a higher degree of certainty. And I'm only using that three day window because everything's gonna diverge. After three days, it's gonna diverge dramatically, really no matter what. Um, so like you can't really go beyond that. So we're looking at like, okay, tactically three days. So then I take that certainty and I combine it with what's the trend. Is the trend as the model changes from run to run or as the two different models diverge, is it trending in my favor or against me? And that can mean many different things. That can mean, is, it getting, is the wind getting stronger? Is the angles changing for or against me? Is the wind getting easier? Um, is this low getting stronger, getting weaker, whatever? What is the trend? Is it trending up? Is it trending down? So a practical example of this then is if I have a, a high degree of uncertainty where the models are changing every time I download a new one and it's changing against me, I'm going to really look closely at my tactics and, and, and maneuver very conservatively. I'm going to make conservative decisions for the next couple of days. On the contrary, if I have a higher degree of certainty and the trend is either stable or in my favor, I might actually make, um, make more aggressive uh, decisions over the next three, four days or however, you know, however long, not, not beyond four days, truly. Another, another thing to like give you an indication of this, Gribs will go out 16 days. The GFS will allow you to model 16 days into the future. But the Ocean Prediction Center at NOAA, they only make, um, they only make synoptic chart predictions for four days. And that yep. like, tells you all you need to know about certainty. The guys that actually sit down and draw the <laughs> forecasts using the models will only go out four days. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's that's very interesting, and uh, yeah, back back to to this this scary uncertainties in the future um, thing. It's like no, nothing's different about those cribs. If you go two weeks into the future, they will they will display their data with the same confidence as the ones that they'll show you for tomorrow, but it's all it's all garbage. So uh. that's right. Um, and the other the other side of this is. Um, Looking at oh shit, I lost my thought now. I told you, I, I told you this off mic. I was up till two fifteen watching the Eagles win last night in overtime, which is why I'm all garbed up here. So my brain is a mush right now. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, for, for those, oh of no, you, I was so only, I, yeah. An- go ahead so another reason. another way to to sort of um, to sort of interpret certainty, um, like a grib will do a better job at modeling the progression of a feature that already exists. So, for example, if there's a low on the chart that is affecting your passage and the low already exists at the time you download the model, it's gonna, that low is going to evolve and the GRIB models have an easier time of predicting that evolution than if they're predicting something that hasn't formed yet. So a lot of times you'll see, like, we'll use, like, uh, um, um, Cape Hatteras is, a, is an area of cyclogenesis. That's where, like, lows form. That sort of north of Cape Hatteras, off of Nova Scotia, the interaction between warm water and cold water, that's like a, where lows tend to form. And you'll often see on a model run, like, okay, you go out a day or two, and then all of a sudden a low pops up in one of those areas and then spins off and does something wild. And a lot of times you'll see those lows that haven't formed yet 
over like a week get like really wild. They'll get really deep or they'll get really gnarly. And I always, I often tell crew like, okay, watch this. Like that's, it's probably going to form. The models are pretty good at saying like, okay, the conditions in this area are ripe for cyclogenesis. Something probably forms. Almost always it, it doesn't do remotely what it said it was going to do before it had actually formed. So that's another area I look at like, okay, if nothing, if this hasn't formed yet, I'm, I'm going to look at that. There's a much lower degree of certainty in something that hasn't formed yet in how the models treat it than something that, that um, has formed and they're just tracking it, so to speak. Right. Yeah, because then they'll have more... It, it's easier to kind of use past experience then for the model to predict what that's going to do in the future rather than um, predicting something that doesn't doesn't exist at all and makes makes sense so uh. yeah and 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 that's a case too where if you look at a uh you know if you ha if you're sailing in an area where like y you it does affect you if a low does form there the the hand drawn weather charts created by weather forecasters are usually much better at predicting the first few days after a low has formed than a model will be and that's where like the forecasters knowledge comes into play because they're looking at a whole bunch of different models and using their knowledge as a forecaster to like create a drawing on that versus, versus like a reminder a weather model is pure math it's pure math it's numbers in numbers out and then the numbers out are displayed on a grid viewer visually and gives you all that pretty nice colors but all it is is numbers in numbers out complete raw data there, that, there's, that's it there's nothing else to it yeah that's a little scary there when you're out in the middle of the ocean and you're getting your uh, your weather forecasts there hasn't been a single human involved in the process it's all automated so but no, but there are humans. It's us. We're the humans. We can. Oh yeah, that, this yeah, is my, good. Oh, I, I love that. This is nice. yes. this is my point. This is my whole point here. Is how do you take this computer data and interpret it? You know yourself, like learning how to do this. Like it's really, and you know, talking about certainty and uncertainty. I've gotten to a level of confidence where I feel pretty good about making weather decisions based on gribs, and yet I still get forecasts from WRI because I'm not a professional and I'm generally a skeptic it's like what am i missing like okay my level of confidence is high and that scares me as well because it's like okay i feel like i have a pretty good handle on how to do this but what am i don't know what i don't know so i always have somebody looking over my shoulder and the way i'll do it is if i i'll look at i'll make my own forecasts and create my own tactics and then i'll ask wri say here's here's what i'm seeing what are you seeing and if they see something different then we have a conversation and if they if they agree with what I'm seeing, then I my confidence is sort of like locked in, so to speak. I feel like okay, I I have a handle on what's going on here. Mm. Yeah, the um and 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 what they they can do very well that uh, at least happened to me twice is that they have you know warned me about the formation of tropical lows that I have just not not been able to see at at all, which can't. You know, on on the gribs when you're out there and you look, everything's looking fine, and then you know, email pops in from Jeremy at WRI like, hey, how how fast do you think you could get south of of such and such parallel? And uh, yeah, so um, no, that is and it's good to have them along. Speaking of WRI, I haven't done this yet, but I was talking to Brian. Uh, so Brian and Jeremy are like our two contacts there, and 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 this is not unique to wri it's all forecasters seem to speak like talking about certainties they the, the language they use in forecasting is very um very confident so like you'll read a forecast that says you know then this will happen then this will happen then this will happen and instead of using the language of like it's forecast to do this based on this we think that like i would i'm i'm trying to convince those guys to change the way they use language in their forecasts to basically remind people that this is a prediction of the future and by nature it's uncertain. Um, and, and it's a fine line because like you have to have confidence in what the weather people are telling you, but you also have to understand that it's an uncertain science. And th the other side of that is like, it doesn't matter what the weather is what the forecast said. If like the forecaster says you're going to get five to 10 knots from the Northeast. Okay. That's great, but it's probably not dead accurate. It might be six to 12 knots. It might be 10 to 15 knots. It might be off. But what you want to know is 
what is generating that wind and how is it evolving? And that goes back to always keeping the big picture. Because, you know, we used to run these rallies and people would get frustrated that, oh, the forecast was 10 knots more than it said it was going to be. It's like, okay, but like, <laughs> did they get the big picture right? Were they accurate as to the where that wind is generated? Where is it coming from? Is it coming from a low pressure? Is it coming from a high pressure? Is it ahead of a cold front, behind it, whatever? Like, if you understand the mechanism that is creating the weather in your specific area, you will have a much easier time accepting the fact that, okay, it might be five or ten knots more or less than it's predicted, but it's still, it's still because of the same mechanism that is created in the first place. Um, and that's, I think, an, a, a, another aspect of this. It's like certainty, trends, and the big picture. Yeah. Um, and and I, I find those three, th- keeping this framed in those three ideas um, just makes it a lot easier to actually create your tactics around this because you're not just following a, you're not following a monorail track. You actually have some flexibility in what you're doing. Yeah. It's. Um, I think they, they they might use. I I don't know. They might use that kind of language um, because it's it's probably what people desperately want when they're out there. And uh, you know, I've I've been in that situation myself and uh, been out there, and you know, things are things are very uncomfortable or scary, and things are looking kind of bleak, and you're kind of just like desperate to know you're just like just you just want to know so bad when when is this going to turn what's going to happen is it going to get worse is it going to uh get better and um yeah both having been out there with those feelings and also having been been the weather router for people i know that just like that just the desperation of wanting to know what's gonna what's gonna happen uh but in a way if you if you do dig into those the big picture stuff and actually don't don't just look at the numbers and the direction of the wind but if you look at the big systems and you 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 know you figure out where the low is and and where it's going and then you do kind of know then there is a there is a kind of the more you understand about the big picture stuff it's it's a lot more soothing in that kind of because that is certain there is a huge big system out there and the difference is that oh it might go uh, it might have gone a couple of miles further north than the forecasters pursued but it's still there that's what's generating it it's just not it's not some weather god who's just pushed a button and it's now it's blowing uh in your face so uh, that's right. And then, the, you know, the specific features that I always emphasize to look out for, and this is another thing that Gribs will not tell you, is, is where the fronts are. So cold fronts in particular, when you're sailing in the mid-latitudes, like we spend most of our time sailing, uh, cold fronts are your biggest feature. They're usually associated with a, a spinning low-pressure system. And the wind on either side of that cold front and the weather, that's like the area of greatest instability. And that's where you can get a big departure from what the actual predictions are because you get localized stuff. Um, a cold front, to remind people, is where a cold air mass that is moving south is, is dipping underneath a warm air mass and creating convection. And that convection creates condensation as it goes aloft. You, cr- get, you get thunderstorms, squalls, rain, precipitation, all the rest. And um, in the Northern Hemisphere, at least, when a low spins counterclockwise, you tend to get increasing southwesterly winds ahead of the cold front. Then sometimes, especially in the fall and spring, an abrupt and strong wind shift to the west and northwest right after it as the rain pushes through and then the clearing happens. Um, and that that abrupt nature of the front, I mean, it's, sometimes it's like clicking a button. It's like you got southwest wind and then boom, northwest. And sometimes that boom can be violent. Mm. So that's like where the anticipation comes in. It's like you really need to learn how to anticipate those frontal passages because if, you, if you're not paying attention, you can really get caught out. Um, especially what can happen is like you get a building southwesterly breeze and then all of a sudden the wind dies. And then there's like an area, it's like the proverbial calm before the storm where all of a sudden you get nothing. Yeah. And now you're like, okay, I need to put up more sail because the wind dies. And it's like, uh-uh take down your sails and just motor for a while and wait for that wall of cold air to come in. And it usually does. Um, and that's where you want to look at like tactically, which, which tack do you want to be on? Um, where do you, and this is where like your rum line goes out the window. You want to set the boat up to, to take the, the coming 
weather and be on the right tack so that you don't accidentally jibe or whatever. I've talked about this a lot. A couple, you know, going across the Atlantic from Bermuda to the Azores, you temp- tend to have these frontal passages where you, you want to almost sail north on a port tack so that as the wind shifts with a cold front, you're just bearing away with the wind shift instead of having to jibe um, and deliberately going off course. And that's where the beauty of cruising is it, you can do that. There's no hurry to get to there. I mean, you can sail 60 miles out of your way um, to, to manage the weather, and it doesn't matter. That's, that's true, yeah. It's, um, in, in a way, it's, um, it's almost more difficult to do weather routing for, for cruising because you just have so many more options like that. In, um, uh, you know, in, uh, as the racers say now with the, I forgot who, who's, who said that, somebody, um, might have been Mark Sinclair of the, he was doing the Ocean Globe race now where he said that you know in in now in like modern racing you just have there's so many sensors so many models and strong computers you basically just load the computer software up and put the weather forecast in and then just like choose one of the colored lines that appears on the on the chart and you just follow that um that's your weather routing but when you're but then of course they're only interested in speed once you once you consider the comfort of the of the crew the the daylight situation and with all these like you have so many options like like you said you can you can just sail in the completely opposite direction for a while you can you can stop you can you can heave to um so it's um in in a way it's a lot tougher because you have so many more more options to choose from it's also tougher it's it's so the what i'm thinking of it's it's like when you have a when you're doing something creative if you have a complete blank slate it's often harder to come up with ideas than if you have some restrictions. Um, so it's the same same sort of idea. Or it's like mm. the okay, you got to go to the mayonnaise aisle and you have a thousand mayonnaises to choose from. It's like just pick one. Uh, <laughs> but so um, th- it's also harder because that same routing software that the racers use also is available to us, and the software doesn't know that you're racing or cruising. The software is simply optimizing to get from A to B as quickly as possible. So it takes a learning curve to figure out how to tell the software, no, actually, I need to optimize for these other things. And you can tell it that, but there's a lot of settings that you need to learn to say, you know, I don't want wind over this or I don't want wind over this. Or what I prefer to do, instead of giving the computer like wind or or parameters like that, I will actually manually look at, okay, where does my route want to be given the way the weather is evolving over the short term? And I'll put restrictive waypoints in there instead of telling the computer to go on the rum line i'll say no i want to go over here and then here and here and here and i'll do that and then i'll also let the computer I'll, I'll sometimes do it with waypoints and then i'll sometimes do it with like okay i don't want to see wind over this wind speed on this angle or whatever and if those two things line up it usually means that i've done a pretty good job of like manually figuring out where my what my route's going to be but mm, you got to remember clever. too like our whole goal in cruising is not to get there as fast as possible it is to get there as safely and as comfortably as possible with the least wear on the boat and the crew um obviously it's it's like a a point of pride to make a fast passage we're we're still trying to make a fast efficient passage Hmm. but and very often those two things are the same like being fast and comfortable and safe is very often they line up yeah that's a all very good point um, so if we if we use kind of if we put this together and use an example, um, the example that I used for this Yachting World article about going to Greenland, um, what happened was we were, we were like we, we we had this passage from St. John's to um, the southern tip of Greenland, a little village called Nanortalik. It's like 800 miles, and I, I broke it down into three challenges. So first of all, 800 miles that's like on Falcon that's a four to six day four to seven day passage, depending on the conditions. So we're already beyond that window of certainty in, in, in the forecasting. And then if we remind ourselves that the output of a grid model is only as good as the input, the fewer inputs you have, the less good output you're going to have. And in parts of the world and in seasons, like there's certain parts of the world that just have less input. They're measuring the atmosphere less often and less regularly. Greenland is one of those places. <laughs> um, so you also look at that. What part of the world am I in? And also what season am I in? So the more remote parts of the world that have less measurement of the atmosphere, you're going to get 
more unpredictability or less certainty in those areas. And then during the shoulder seasons, like fall and spring, when you have more volatility in the atmosphere, you're going to get more uncertainty. So right off the bat, like not even looking at the models, you, you know that you have a higher degree of uncertainty with the, in those specific instances. So four to seven days, we don't know what's going to be like when we get to Greenland. So we broke it down into three challenges. The first challenge was getting a, out of Iceberg Alley, as they call it. So like St. John's, the coast of Newfoundland, you get the Labrador current that comes down from West Greenland, and that whole Labrador coast down around Newfoundland is just full with icebergs. Now that line retreats north as the summer progresses. So we had um, not a lot of ice, but enough that we had to pay attention to it for about the first third of the passage. And then you add on top of that, that Newfoundland and the Grand Banks is like the foggiest place in the world. And now you have potential ice and low visibility. So challenge number one is getting across that. Then the middle third of the passage, you have mostly open water. Where, well, you have open water where you have these iceberg charts that show um, where, because they actually monitor this. They fly planes over and stuff up there because there's a lot of shipping north of Newfoundland. Um, so we had a, a high degree of certainty that in the middle section, there was no ice at all. So we could just per proceed at full speed and not stress about it. And then you get to landfall section. The last bit of the passage, you have this 60 mile wide band of ice potential around the southern tip of Greenland where you have the southerly current coming down the east coast of Greenland, bends around Cape Farewell, takes the icebergs up north the west coast of Greenland, and then that filters back down into the Labrador current. So you have like this 60-mile band of ice where now we have to get across, and that was much, much heavier. Like that was, that was a lot of ice, a uh, mixture of icebergs and sea ice. So now the final third of the passage, we have to approach the coast in the right conditions where we can see and have manageable weather to get through that iceberg belt. And not only with fog, but with daylight. You know, we're actually, Greenland is an icy place, but where we were is actually south of the Arctic Circle. So unlike Svalbard, where you and I have spent some time, Svalbard's easier because you have, it never gets dark. So unless it's foggy, you can always see. And around ice, you know, being able to see is obviously critical. Quite critical. So that was that was the three challenges of the of the passage. And I knew that I wouldn't be able to plan the final third of that until we were already at sea because of the nature of the uncertain weather forecast in the, in the long term. So all I could do was find a good window to get out, to get out to sea. So that's another aspect of this. When you're looking for a weather window to leave, because you have no certainty in the long run, just find a nice window to leave. So we actually waited in port for like two days to let a little system blow through. Instead of leaving in wind and rain, we left in a calm and motored for the first 36 hours. And like, I will always prefer to do that than go out into bad weather, especially with ice and stuff around. So we had a pretty boring start to the trip, which is exactly how I like it. Left that's, in a calm. That's great. Motored up the coast, kind of had crystal clear weather after this cold front went through because you had northwesterly wind, you get dry, cold air, no fog. So we managed to get across that first ice section in clear visibility, which was like priority number one, clear visibility. And we actually saw an iceberg in the middle of the night, like on the, it popped up on the radar. We were in a, they, they do these squares, five degrees by five degrees, and mm. they give you how many icebergs are in any given square. Now, five degrees latitude that's 300 miles it's a huge area a and lot. the square we were in had three icebergs so i actually thought it was lucky that we saw one it was like oh this is awesome there's a target on the radar could it be an iceberg it's not it's like holy shit there's an iceberg over there it's like wow we're actually doing this so that was that was really cool and we, we passed it at like a mile and a half um yeah so we made it through that first third of the passage again goal was just to get out of st john's in clear visibility and stable weather to get our sea legs so mission accomplished Second third of the passage, full steam ahead. Sail the boat as fast as we could, and we actually had some nice weather to do so. We had a really nice reaching conditions for that middle third. And, um, and, then the th and then as we're in that middle third, now I'm starting to look ahead and plan for our arrival and to getting through. So uh, arrival was two stages, basically. You have arrival to the edge of the iceberg belt, which is like 60 miles from the coast, and then you have actual mm -hmm. landfall itself. So again, that was like, okay, trying to get good visibility, but that, nothing I could really do about that. Um, so now I was trying to optimize for daylight, at least. If we couldn't have, if we couldn't, if, if we were going to have fog, we could at least have in the daylight and, uh, and wind angles. So as you're approaching a sort of, uh, you know, tight quarters, because I didn't know how heavy the ice was going to be or whatever, um, I wanted maneuverability. So what happened was the wind was blowing from the west 
And as we were sailing north, it started heading us. North, uh, so, so west, northwest, north. Mm. And we're sort of, we were like reaching, close reaching. Okay, shit, all of a sudden we're close hauled and now the wind's blowing 25 knots and we're down to staysail and two reefs and it's like not that comfortable. And now we're getting, if we had continued sailing close hauled, we were going to get east of our rum line, which, okay, no big deal. We're cruising. It doesn't really matter. But I wanted to be in a position where we would be to windward as we made our final approach across that ice belt. I kind of, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking I'm like a master and commander here. I wanted, I wanted the, what do you call that? The, the weather, weather gauge. gauge. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted the weather gauge because it's much easier to maneuver the boat, um, if you're re- reaching or broad reaching than if you're close hauled, obviously, because close hauled, you only have two options. You either fall off or you tack. Not only that, but you're heeled over. It's hard to see under the sails. It just makes life more difficult. Hmm. So in the next two to three days in our, in our two day weather window of high certainty, uh, with the gribs, it appeared that the wind was going to start backing again and go back to the West. So opening up that wind angle. So I had a choice. It's like, okay, do we continue close hauled and get set much further east and then have to beat our way back to that weather gauge position or do we just stop do we stop the boat and wait for that wind to back and now we can get on course again after the wind has backed enough to be a free a freeing wind or a wind where we don't have to sail close hauled and allow me now to sail high of the rum line and get an even better weather gauge position in easier conditions and to boot i was going to have to stop at some point anyway because we were going to arrive at that edge of that ice belt in darkness if we didn't stop Mm -hmm. so it was either like we beat our brains out through the night and then stop or we continue sailing uh or or we stop now and then get that position now the problem with the decision was it was still like two days out it was still pretty long way away so I, i also in the back of my head it's like well it's better just to get there and then stop. Like, let's get there and, and like get time on our side because we don't know what the weather's going to do. You know, that two day window, I'm at the I'm at the edge of my comfort level with like what's certain or not. So what's going to mm. come after that? But we opted to stop and it turned out to be the right call because the wind did back. We got underway the next day. I think we only hove to for like six or eight hours. It wasn't even that long. Uh, wind backed and we put ourselves in a perfect position. The only downside was it was the heaviest fog on the whole trip. So now we were like <laughs> approaching the iceberg limit. We had we 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 had the weather gauge. We're now broad reaching, full sail, going like ten knots. It's blowing like twenty five knots, and I just said, okay. The second we see a target on the radar, we're like downshifting here. We're going way too fast. You couldn't see anything. I mean, you could. It was daylight, but you could. It was like you could see maybe two hundred yards. Hmm. So we saw our big. We saw our first target. It's like okay, slow this ship down. We went to three reefs in the main and the staysail, and and in 25 knots falcon was still going six knots but it felt like we were crawling because like we had no sail up and we we're just kind of cruising along yeah. and we sent a bow watch to the bow and um now now the tension was like okay there's gonna be smaller pieces of ice that don't show up on the radar are we gonna be able to see them especially when it's blowing 25 then you've you've got some uh, some wave crests and stuff that's that's gonna exactly cover the smaller pieces of ice on the on the radar so when we did finally see that first little growler, it actually gave us some comfort because it's like, okay, we actually can see this. Everyone knows what to look for now. Um, we saw it from probably 100, 200 yards off. Plenty of time to actually maneuver if we had to and maneuver because the boat's flat um, and we can go, we can turn the boat in any direction because we, like, we have that weather gauge position. We can go left, we can go right, we can round up and stop. We have so many options mm. um, and that's... That's how we navigated that last 60 miles. And, uh, and it was super exciting, but also like just such a good example of, of how all this works together and like totally. how thinking yeah. about cruising, because it's like if I had just continued sailing, you know, it would have been a lot different had we been 100 miles further east, beating against 25 knots of wind, tacking around this, trying to get our way back upwind would have been a completely different experience that you know, wouldn't have been that uncommon to actually just like to just do. It's it's hard to stop the boat when the conditions are good. Like mentally, you feel like yeah. a pussy. Yeah, it's no, like, it's true. And it, it can be sometimes it can be hard to sell to the crew as well. Uh, yeah, to, to kind of just stop the stop the boat. But but man, when you're right in cases like that, it's that is a very, very good feeling. The thing is, though, it's never wasted, right? Like stopping the boat is never wasted because if you can stop the boat and and 
and just, okay, everyone's resting. You're in rest, rest mode now. All of a sudden, now, you know, it was cold as well. So now we only have to have one person on watch. Everyone else can be, you know, standby down below in the heat. You only have to do an hour at a time. All you're doing is sitting under the Dodger looking for traffic, keeping an eye on the radar. And even if the plan would have backfired, we still would have gained six to eight hours of rest to make yeah. whatever the uncertain future is easier. So like... But it is hard to do it in the moment. It's hard to stop the boat when you don't have to. Now, on the second leg from Greenland to Iceland, it, the conditions were so horrendous that we had to stop the boat because it was like we were launching off these waves. I was like, this is out of control. Stop this roller coaster. But that was a completely mm. different scenario. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, um, that is a, it's a, it's a, it's a great point. Like instead of, instead of uh, yeah, those close hauling all the way. Kind of like what you said in the... Um, in the beginning, like it's just this, like you're just waiting before de- before departure. Like you said, just, just wait until you have a, a, a smooth start to the to the trip. At least you at least you know that. Kind of the same can be true for just stopping for a little bit. And those- yeah, that patience. It's hard to be. It's hard to be. Pa- it's hard to be patient when the conditions in your area are good. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Because you have that. You know. You have that other phrase in the back of your head: "Never waste a fair wind." Yep, <laughs> that that is creeping in there. It's like, oh, but but I think uh, I think that combination of like skepticism and patience and looking at tactics in the short term is a is a really uh, a, a powerful combination. Yeah, I was um, this year. I was uh, I fell fell victim to that once we were gonna crossing over the over the north sea from uh, Faya, you know the island we went to we staged yeah yeah yep. staged there and um and i there, there was gonna be a, a bit of a front that was gonna blow past like in the really very early morning and um i figured okay we'll just wait wait for that to pass and then we're off but then the like the evening came along there's just like this beautiful wind blowing off the land. The sun was just coming down out in, into the sea there, and I just thought, you know what, we we just we just gotta go. We just gotta get out there, and um, and we did. And uh, yeah, we we were tossed around just a little bit by that front, and it was probably probably not the not not the wisest decision in that that regard. But man, I think I do think those hours um, were worth it in that in that in that case well so we have the added challenge of like most of the people that sail with us actually want that they want to go out in the heavy conditions under you know soup professional supervision so we have that like kind of obligation to to walk that fine line between what is safe and a good learning experience versus what is like hey guys we can't go out here this is this is foolish like we're being stupid here if we seek this out um and that's a that's a tough tough line to walk yeah yeah, that's um, that's right. It's interesting when you kind of do it on do it on purpose. Like I, I, I did it very much on purpose. Um, during these, we did these uh, offshore sailing camps on East Beyond, just along the Norwegian coast here, and we were kind of at. It was on, on both of those. We had like it was, the weather was just perfect. We had like beautiful, great conditions all week, but then like one day of really like forty knots, pretty rough conditions, and we were like. At, at the dock, you know, rigging up all the all the the, the, the storm sails and and all this stuff, and then just like headed out in into it for you know just four or five hours of just like proper proper uh, heavy weather sailing, and then just tucked back into the into the fjords. But yeah, so that was so we uh, we had on on the sail training trip in Portugal. I had exactly the opposite of that, where we were sitting right like where Lagos was, was like smack at the end of this long ridge of high pressure and zero wind. Hmm. So now it's just like, okay, I've got a week of what is billed as sail training and along the south coast of Portugal, there's no wind. So, okay, now (laughs) we need to go, now we need to find the wind. Now we need to like look at this again and say, okay, what are my, where where am I going to increase my chances of actually finding the breeze? And now we had, you know, we talked about this last week with the Orca situation. I didn't want to go east because Gibraltar is where the hot spot for orcas was, yep. but we had to go east because if we went west and out into the Atlantic, we'd just sail right smack into the center of that high pressure ridge, which was also forecast to move slightly north and west, like drift ever so slightly north and west. So high spin clockwise, 
So if I went east, it had a greater chance of us hooking into the backside of that high and getting some north northeasterly breezes. And we, we managed to. We sailed 450 miles um, without really we ran the engine once or twice for a couple hours when it flat calm but like had the spinnaker up we actually managed to to find the breeze um and that again is kind of another part of the strategy is okay if you have light wind where do you go to find the wind and how do you look at that and how you know you always you, like in this case the trend in the gribs was that the high was drifting was pretty much stationary but if anything was drifting west and north so just mm. sail away from that. Sail go away from the direction that the high is drifting because that's where the, <laughs> the center. There's no wind, and we did that, and it worked. And we didn't see any orcas. We still managed to stay at least 150 miles west of Gibraltar. Very nice. Yeah, but t- talking about the um, the the options of uh, cruising, like in that scenario, and also my um, uh, it's training camp scenario, there you, you don't even have a start and an end port. You just have right. you can go. You can go absolutely anywhere you like and we also have the option of using the engine which is unique to at least uh most races won't allow you to use your engine so that can also be used in in kind of interesting strategic ways of especially finding wind as you say Mm. um so to wrap this up and maybe this is good to like if you want to when you're editing this snag this section and put it right at the top because because it took us a while to get to this summary but like i think to summarize this how we th- how i've been thinking about this and i need to write th- i need to like write this to get my thoughts super clearly but if i can summarize it's like okay we we want to look at how certain or uncertain we are in the forecast models so kind of get an idea of like am i do i have a higher degree of certainty or a lower degree of certainty, and what's affecting that certainty with it, whether the geographic location on the Earth, the season, fall, spring, whatever. But look at that certainty, okay? How certain or uncertain am I? Then with the change in GRIB model runs, what's the trend? Is the trend favoring or um, or going against me? Uh, and kind of use those two things to, to create the tactics, but always anticipating kind of staying one step ahead of the weather because you're, you're going to have a really high degree of certainty in the 24 to 48 hour range. So you should never get caught. Like people that say, Oh, I got caught out. It's like, if you can't really say that anymore, (laughs) we have enough weather tools that you shouldn't ever get caught out. You might have, you know, a frontal passage where it blows twice as strong as the forecast said. But if you listen to this podcast, you should have expected that because that's where you have the highest degree of uncertainty in those specific localized systems. So I think that's kind of my summary. It's like understanding that we're a, a, what a weather model is, is a prediction of the future. Future predictions with anything are impossible. Future predictions with complex systems, as Malcolm from Jurassic Park tells us, are doubly impossible. Hmm. And, um, and we need to look at trends to, to see what our tactics are going to be in the, in the foreseeable future. If it's trending up or if it's trending in our favor, maybe I can shake a reef out earlier than I would. If it's trending against me, maybe I want to like earlier than I thought I would set up for whatever that trend is heading towards. Um, and that's kind of how I'd summarize this is anticipating the certainty and the trend and making decisions based on that. Yeah, that is an excellent, excellent summary and a great approach, I think. Mm. Very nice. Cool. I'm pretty excited about the what AI might do to our weather forecasting. It seems like the perfect perfect thing for AI. Just a huge complex data set to just dig into. You think there might well, be something there? At the very least, what I've been using it for is when we describe the passages on the website, like for the future calendars, we have a section now that says expected weather pattern, like our typical weather pattern. And I'll put in there like Please, Chat GPT, describe what a <laughs> d- describe the typical weather pattern in in Mariner's terminology on what a passage in June from Hawaii to Alaska might look like. There we go. That is, I mean, but that is that is AI doing weather routing for you, right there. Well, that's Just in uh, a that's very, it. Rudim- very rudimentary, but still. Well, that's it's doing it. It's th- that's doing it in your like seasonal planning right like that's Mm. like the ai version of jimmy cornell's world cruising routes like eventually you should be able to just plug in like okay 
um, where should I go? What, what, what's the weather going to be like historically? That's basically your pilot charts, your AI pilot charts. Like, yeah. But if you're, if you're AI, because all of these less, less, like chat GPT and now work on mostly historical data, or at least they're a couple of years old. So that, that'll be, yeah, like your pilot chart stuff. If your AI had access to current data, it could look, could just assimilate, and look at all of. Well, these I mean, isn't that what the Grib lines. viewers? Are, isn't that what a Grib program is doing though? Just without language, it's doing that numerically, isn't it? That's what it's giving you when it gives you your. Is that not? Oh, I guess. I guess what's the, probably, what's yeah. the difference? I mean, when it spits out a route, what is? How is that not a version of AI? I mean, it's not language; it's not describing it to you. Yeah, but. it's an it's yeah it's it's math. It's an algorithm, so maybe it's the same thing. It's in the same realm. I mean, here's here's we're out of our depth maybe, here. Oh, we should go. You should that. go listen to a, a different podcast, dear listeners. We're we're, we're out. We're this is we're yeah. t- t- too deep of water for us. <laughs> um, speaking of chaos, so th- so this is that book. Um, uh, it's literally called Chaos. Uh, mm. It's it says the the subtitle is the amazing science of the unpredictable. Um, so read this book. Go reread Jurassic Park. Um, and you'll, f- it's remarkable how much chaos theory is in Jurassic Park throughout and how they describe it. And that's the cool thing about that book. Obviously it's fiction, but like all the science, the chaos theory science, at least in there is, is, um, is real. And, uh, it's, and obviously Malcolm Jeff Goldblum's like the cool, the best character in that whole movie. <laughs> he's, uh, he's great. That is, it is, it is a very good book. I read a book and watched the film again quite recently too, actually. It's um, so good. That's my number, that's my number times. three movie of all time. Well, I should give us, before we hang up, give us your number two and your number one, Andy. Uh, number one, Top Gun. Uh, number two, Jaws. And number three, Jurassic Park. Wow classics e- easy nice. easy top it's an easy top three everything it's like those exist like separate from from the rest of the list okay so it's a it's a, it's it's quite a gap down to number four um yeah yeah what's your top three uh no i couldn't give you a top three number one though it's master and commander easy oh of course easy nice <laughs> so the, the other choice. ones are quite and that is that's been consistently on top for for years and years the other ones they they're not so stable so so do you know um th- this comes up in this book you know what you know what a, you know what fractals are uh no fractals maybe but not in english possibly so fractals is this mathematical it's it's a mathematical thing where when you zoom the further you zoom in on something the less you can measure it got it so like a coastline for example is like infinite like infinitely long because if you try and measure it at the smallest scale it just keeps getting more crazy yep so that's like part of it, and then and then also the idea that like fractals say that like regardless of the scale, things are the things look the same. Like a, the, a simple version of this is like a mountain, a jagged mountain peak from a distance looks the same as a jagged mountain range from a distance looks the same as a single mountain peak looks the same as a rock taken off that mountain mm. looks the same as like the molecular structure of that rock, whatever. Um, I just want to give a shout out to Laz, who Laz is probably if Laz is listening to this, he's got, he's probably like guys, bring me on. I can talk about AI because he he's a programmer for Google. Um, oh, very nice. He was a, a fifty nine North crew way back in the day. Now has his own boat, but he had a really fun T shirt that had a, a handlebar mustache, but it was a fractal pattern, and it said like Mandelbrot Mandelbrot mustache or something because Mandelbrot was like the mathematician that came up with this fractal geometry thing oh, and it nice. was a very very nerdy t-shirt but I was like that is awesome so shout out to Laz and his Mandelbrot mustache t-shirt very cool yeah Laz if you want to if you want to explain to us uh, the difference between um, the algorithms making grid files and and an <laughs> AI language model please uh, please uh, let us know yeah <laughs> All right, let's wrap this up. We're getting cool. way, we're getting way off topic, but uh, this is this is fun. Thanks for thanks for being flexible and shifting gears here at the last second because this is not what we were intending to talk about. Absolutely, yeah. No, this uh, I feel like this this happens most of the time when we're we're planning these podcasts. We have we have a topic in mind, and then a couple of days or the day before we we record, somebody most most often you Andy just uh, come up with something else that you've thought about or excited us or whatever, and we. Just go for that, but it's cool. I think I think it it 
you know it keeps us um excited and um that's um that's what we want I'll put I'll pull out the, the little sidebar section I wrote for that article that I referencing for Yachting World and we'll I'll put that on the quarter deck because I have a much longer version of it that won't make it in the magazine that I'll stick in the quarter deck sometime soon so look out for that also um, plug this at the top August but on the wind starts again uh, next week I believe that's right this is the last quarter deck sailing podcast episode of this uh, little mini season so um, we're gonna hand it over to on the wind from here so um yeah thanks for uh, thanks for listening in uh, this time around and next week we're gonna have uh, on the wind we'll back on all right thanks skipper great thanks andy have a good one hold fast hold fast thank you very much for listening if you want to join the quarterdeck go to quarterdeck.59-north.com the Quarter Deck Podcast is produced by August Sandberg for 59 North. Music is by the Storm Weather Shanty Choir.